I'm Kathy Reed, and on behalf of the PIDEA program, I welcome you to the third of four lectures in the PIDEA Text and Issues lecture series on the theme, Decolonizing PIDEA, Revising the Pro and Processes of Education. Tonight, I'm honored to introduce Luther College Professor of Music and Composer in Residence, Brooke Joyce. Brooke also serves as Music Director at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. He holds composition degrees from Lawrence University and the Cleveland Institute of Music and Princeton University. He's won multiple awards and his pieces have been performed nationally and internationally. Most recently, his 2020 composition, He Hung His Head and Died, 12 Variations on George Floyd, was aired on American Public Radio's performance today. Brooke brings his broad-minded creativity and his commitment to social justice to his compositions, to his work as a church musician, to the classroom, and to his role as faculty advisor of the Music Department Anti-Racism Task Force. Brooke inspires me to rethink my own teaching all the time, and I look forward to learning more in this presentation on decolonizing the music theory classroom. Brooke plans to speak for just about 40 minutes or so, leaving plenty of time for questions and discussions at the end. Please welcome Professor Joyce. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues from the VPA, from the music department, from the English department, uh, members of the task force, my theory students, uh, both this semester, last semester, and last year, as well as my friend Liz Rogg for some really wonderful conversations that have helped me uh, frame our conversation uh, tonight. Keegan and Kyle, if you're listening, there is an Easter egg for you in this presentation, okay? There's a little bit of Hamilton, and if you can tell me where it comes from when I get home, you get a special prize. <laughs> All right, we'll begin with a prelude. Now, my guess is you liked what I just played. It has such a vivid character, such great harmonies. Not sure this microphone is on, but I'll just project. And we love those cool slides in the right hand. Now, can we learn why this excerpt is so satisfying? Uh, perhaps by applying some principles of traditional music theory. Well, the glissandi, that's that, and the tremolos are expressions. That is, their surface details that are part of performance practice. Music theory, as it's taught today, doesn't really delve into that area of musical expression. Theory is mostly concerned with harmony. So, what about the harmonies? Well, this is problematic. The underlying chord progression here is a 12-bar blues, which in this key sounds something like this. Now that probably sounds familiar to you. It is the backbone of a lot of jazz and popular music written in the past century. It has three chords, a G7 chord in this key, C7 chord, D7 chord, that's it. But traditional music theory tells us when we take a chord like this and add a seventh, the seventh is dissonant and it needs to resolve down by step. You can't just append a seventh onto a triad. That's breaking a cardinal rule. The other problem is that this particular 12 bar blues that I, not the one that I improvised, but the one that I played at the beginning, it has an extra chord in it, an A minor seven chord, okay? 
Um, if I was to play the next 12 bars of the piece, you would hear that chord, but in the introduction, Oscar Peterson swaps out that chord for this, an E flat seven chord. It's a tritone substitution. Um, in essence, the piece begins with a variation before the tune even shows up, which is pretty, pretty cool actually. So in short, traditional music theory has very little to illuminate here. And this is not an obscure piece. Uh, this is the transcription of Oscar Peterson's version of Night Train that he recorded in 1963. It's one of the most uh, beloved, highly regarded jazz albums I've recorded from three master musicians. Okay, so part one, what is music theory? That's going out to all my Theory 4 students who need to work on that for tomorrow. <laughs> if you're an aspiring collegiate musician in this country, you will most likely be required to take two years of a series of courses called Music Theory. This is true across most colleges, universities, and conservatories. Some Bachelor of Arts programs may require a bit less. Some conservatories and some specialized majors like Music Theory or Composition might require a little more. The two-year sequence has been the standard in this country for more than five decades. Here at Luther, two years are required of music majors with an optional fifth semester that's offered occasionally. Now the term music theory is a misnomer for at least two reasons. First of all, the ideas that are presented in a music theory class and the methodology are not treated as mere theories. They're, they're broadly understood to be self-evident truths. And though most course titles don't provide qualifiers, when we say music theory at the collegiate level, what we really mean is the harmonic style of 18th and early 19th century European musicians. And there is one particular 18th century musician whose work started us on the path that we tried today, and that is Jean-Philippe Rameau, a French composer, music theorist, who lived from 1683 to 1764. Rameau wrote a treatise on musical harmony published 300 years ago, 1722, that begins by reasserting ideas espoused by ancient Greek musicians uh, who derived musical intervals from the overtone series. The second book of Rameau's treatise culminates in a systematic discussion of harmony that places the triad, three note chord, at the center of musical structure. Now, we can quickly trace his line of inquiry. So, let's start with this note here. Low C, cello C. That string is, is right now vibrating in one section, the first partial. If I were to lightly touch halfway down the string, it should now vibrate in two parts. Sorry. There it is. We get a note that's exactly one octave higher. If I divide the string in three parts, I get a note that's a fifth higher than that. Four parts. octave above where I started, a third above that, another third above that, and then finally, if I divide it in seven parts, I can find it. There it is, the seventh partial. So to play those on the piano, Those are the first eight parcels of the overtone series. And you may have noticed, and that's just the way that Pythagoras described them. Partials four, five, six, make that sound. We'll call that a C major chord. Well, actually Rameau called it that, so we'll call it that too. So medieval philosophers, often channeling the ancient Greeks, suggested various ways to use the overtone series to create musical scales and modes. Now, by the time of Rameau, a tuning system of equal temperament 
was gaining traction, making it possible for a musician to play in the major and minor keys that, that we uh, know today. Now, Rameau went several steps further. He posited that the bottom note of our C major chord is the foundation, the root um, of the sonority, and that when we write music in the key of C major, that C is home. That's our home chord, our tonic chord, we call it. He further theorized that the chord that's a fifth above, which in the case is G major, is the dominant. The dominant chord really wants to resolve to the tonic triad. Furthermore, if you go a fifth below where we started, that's an F major chord. He called that the subdominant. And that really wants to go to the dominant and then to the tonic. Voila, we have our primary building blocks of tonic, subdominant, and dominant harmonies, known to musicians as the one, four, and five chords. You can play any rock tune now. No, you can't. Rock music is not one, four, five. It's one flat seven four, but that's another discussion. Rameau, as both theorist and composer, alongside his contemporaries, codified a harmonic language uh, that would soon lead to some of the rules <laughs> that music students are so familiar with. Number one, music tends to start and end on the tonic harmony. If you're going to write in C major, you're probably going to start with that chord, and you're probably going to end on that chord. Two, the tonic harmony can be followed by any other chord mostly chords that fit in that key. So for in C major, another chord built on a white note, let's say. Subdominant harmonies tend to lead to dominant harmonies, which tend to lead to tonic harmonies. So there's a, there's a little trajectory there. Now, his, for historical reasons, Rameau presents many of his musical examples in the form of short four-voice chorales, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. And to this day, right, students, uh, we ask you to write exercises in four-voice chorales. Um, now, we're obeying many of the same contrapuntal guidelines that Rameau conveyed in 1722, but those conventions are actually older than that, at least 100 years older than that. Um, they often originated in the music of Renaissance composers like Giovanni de Palestrina, who lived from 1525 to 1594. Going out to all you conducting students, do you recognize that? That's Siku Cervus. Okay, there you go. In other words, most of the musical training provided to young musicians today, at least in the music theory classroom, at Luther and most places in this country, comes from a 300-year-old treatise informed by 500-year-old contrapuntal music, nearly all of which was composed by white Western European men. Now, to put that assertion in relief, um, consider one of the best-selling music theory textbooks in circulation today, uh, the one that we've used at Luther for many years. It's called The Musician's Guide to Theory and Analysis. The latest edition runs 911 pages. We cover material in roughly 865 of those pages, give or take. About 660 of those pages, about 76%, concern musical structures that were in widespread use at the turn of the 19th century in Western Europe. So to put it another way, three out of four semesters of music theory at Luther College and elsewhere is focused on music from the time of Napoleon's march through Europe. This seems odd. <laughs> Even to me, uh, who has taught a section of theory or ear training, uh, at Luther almost every semester for 17 years. Uh, and moreover, as a practitioner of uh, contemporary concert music and a listener of many varied musical genres, I know that virtually no living composer outside of academia and some isolated musical corners adheres closely to the tenets of 18th and early 19th century European musicians. And yet, this tiny, tiny sliver of global historical musical activity informs so much of what we claim to understand about music in general. So it's not unusual for classically trained musicians to apply 
18th century European harmonic labels, for example, to jazz or to various uh, subgenres of popular music. Now, in some cases, I think those labels can, can make sense. They, they can be applied and they can be helpful in illuminating, but often they are ill-suited uh, to help us make sense of the music. And the problem is, in, in those scenarios, one can sometimes make the erroneous conclusion that the music must be primitive or flawed or unrefined. Those, by the way, are all terms that are often used to describe jazz, even recently. I pulled these from, from uh, articles within the last five years. Okay, part two. Who has colonized our classroom? Musically speaking, the land we call the United States has a unique history. Though vestiges of ancient indigenous cultures remain, particularly in place names like Iowa and Wakan, and descendants of indigenous people live both on reservations and among the general population, very little indigenous music forms part of our current cultural landscape in this country. There are many reasons for this, some having to do with forced migration, war, loss of cultural capital, as well as the reality that for many indigenous cultures, music is often inseparable from, from dance and ritual. So the notion of attending a concert of indigenous music doesn't oftentimes make a whole lot of sense. Instead, most of our musical landscape is informed by people who settled on this land, including those who came willingly and those who arrived as enslaved people. The British settlers who first established colonies on the East Coast brought their folk traditions with them. And through the 20th century, one could, for example, identify particular and distinct fiddling traditions practiced in the hollows of Kentucky, Virginia, and West Virginia. And I'm referring here to particular um, ethnomusicological research that was done in the early and mid 20th century by people like Alan Lomax. I'm not sure that standard bearers of those traditions are still around in, in 2022. Folk tunes like the ballad of Captain Kidd became the model for new popular songs in the colonies. Eventually that tune uh, became the prototype for the hymn tune, Wondrous Love. So Captain Kidd sounds like this. Settlers also brought aspects of European concert music culture, and during the Revolutionary War period, the first American-born composers like William Billings began to publish concert and choral music in places like Philadelphia, New York, and Boston, um, for example. Enslaved people also brought their musical and cultural traditions to America. Work songs, plantation songs, spirituals, and other musical genres accompanied day-to-day -day life in the 18th and 19th century American South. In the late 19th century, the first true popular music craze in American history occurs with the advent of ragtime. Almost simultaneously, by the turn of the 20th century, the Delta Blues was one of the preeminent musical genres. And when it became part of the cultural landscape in New Orleans, a process of cultural creolization occurred and a new musical form was born, jazz.
now arrived at the turn of the 20th century, and barely a mention of any of the music I have just described and played has made its way into our curriculum. Now, Scott Joplin does appear in our current textbook, mainly because his music often features a particular chromatic harmony that we often find in 19th century European concert music, known to second year mu uh, music theory students as the flat six. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm very happy that his pineapple rag is included as a musical example in our textbook. I commend the authors for adding more and more examples of female and BIPOC composers in the latest edition of their 911 page book. But the context in which we find Joplin is not a discussion of stride piano figuration in the left hand, melodic invention, or syncopated rhythm, which I, I think are equally or more important musical elements than harmony in Joplin's music. Instead, he is, I fear, a token example of a BIPOC composer who happens to include a harmony also loved by people like Schubert. And this seems to be the current process for diversifying the music theory classroom. We remain shackled to an ancient theoretical system and occasionally send a kite to something more contemporary, perhaps something by a BIPOC musician. I've done it myself many times. That flat six chord also shows up in Hamilton. Theorist Philip Ewell calls this music theory's white racial frame. That is, the underlying systems we teach are almost entirely based on white European composers from the 18th and early 19th century. And music that operates under different rules, albeit you know, rules that often run parallel to traditional uh, music theory, is simply not present, or present only in a much truncated form. In our theory textbook, out of 40, four zero chapters, two deal with popular and jazz music. But music seems to be an anomaly among creative disciplines. My colleagues who teach studio art all independently described a similar pedagogical approach they take to dealing with the past. They start by considering a contemporary artist and then maybe highlight an element from their work that might echo something from the near or distant past. But the contemporary work is the focus, not the historical precedent. In the theater domain, Professor Virtus uh, described a contemporary actor's training as really starting these days with the work of Stanislavski in the early 20th century. But this theory has been adapted and changed over time. And the other theoretical work an actor might uh, encounter in his or her training could have been developed in the last 50 years or less. In teaching creative writing, uh, my colleague uh, Amy Weldon describes a variety of traditions and resources that she draws in her course, including research by cognitive neuroscientists to help her students write creatively and effectively for the widest possible audience. I used the word shackled earlier because I believe that those of us who teach music theory often feel bound to its historical gravity. It is a compelling conception of musical harmony and it is very helpful in understanding certain types of musical expression, but it is inadequate in helping us understand music that doesn't conform to its assumptions. Fortunately, much of the theory and its nomenclature can be massaged, we'll say, and utilized with other music. So I'd like to turn now to a Billboard Top 100 hit released about one year ago. So this is part three now. Leave the door open for Blue Magic.
This song, I Will Spare You from Listening to My Singing Voice, is Leave the Door Open by Bruno Mars and Anderson Pock, who together compose the duo Silk Sonic. If you listen to this song, and especially if you watch the music videos, especially their appearance at the 2021 Grammy Awards, you might notice that they are consciously inhabiting the musical and cultural space of the early 1970s and the sound of Philadelphia. More specifically, I believe this song is an homage to Blue Magic's hit single, Sideshow, from 1974. Yes, the genre references and cosmetic similarities are, are fairly easy to spot, but at another deeper level, I think there are particular harmonic choices made in each song that make them kindred spirits. So if we tilt Rameau's uh, theoretical lens ever so slightly, maybe we can, we can try and spot them. Okay, I'm gonna get into the, the weeds here. So if you're watching at home, you could switch over to the Olympics for a few minutes and then come back. Here you don't have that option, sorry. Um, okay, so leave the door open is actually pitched in C major. That's the key. Although you wouldn't guess it from the, I would call it a circuitous harmonic progression uh, that is in the verse, in the pre-chorus, and in the chorus. It's the same progression with a few alterations. Each phrase begins with this chord, which we would call the four chord or the subdominant chord, right? Um, and then the progression goes like this. F, a G chord with F in the bass, E minor seven, A minor seven. And then it goes right back to the F chord. So it's a rather circular progression uh, that has the effect of making that return to the F chord always sound, well, to me at least, a little, a little wistful, as if the music is kind of longing to move beyond its boundaries. And when it does in the pre-chorus, it goes somewhere completely unexpected. Um, it's one of the great, I would call it a harmonic tributary in modern uh, song rating. So the progression in that section goes. And then the bass crawls up. E flat major seven, A flat major seven, G, F. We reach that harmony right there. That's That's, a stand-in for a dominant chord. It's really an F chord in the right hand, a G in the bass. What it should go to is something like that, but it doesn't. It goes. It goes right back to the F chord. And because we're leaving the door open, we haven't sealed the deal yet. The door is still open, so we don't capitalize on that dominant harmony when we get to the chorus, but instead sync back to the F7. Finally, at the end of the chorus, we get to that uh, C major chord. So we get... Um, that chord right there, that's reaching back even further than the 1970s. It's a Motown chord, that little turnaround. Now, the connections between Silk Sonic and Blue Magic are obvious if you watch the videos. As I mentioned, I encourage you to do that. They're terrific. Um, also, the variety of instruments they use. The Sound of Philadelphia had a house orchestra, so they had horns, strings, glockenspiel, harp, lots of orchestral instruments there. Silk Sonic doesn't go quite that far, but there is a glockenspiel in there, little orchestral bells. Harmonically, though, I think these songs are kind of linked at their core and that barely just each just kind of touches the tonic chord of the piece and then backs away from it. It's a particular device, excuse me, device. So um, here's the end of the verse of Sideshow leading into the end of the chorus and, and maybe you'll hear kind of what I'm talking about. Okay, so this one is in uh, this key, key of G. So end of the verse is... Um, So again, that's a dominant chord. That's where Rameau, if you allowed a, uh, an added second note there, would, would want that chord to go. But it's here and it goes, it goes a step lower. 
Um, so there's actually a term for that in traditional music theory. It's called a retrogression. Don't do that. That's not allowed. That's not allowed, right? That's not a strong progression. You want to go subdominant, dominant, tonic. Not dominant to subdominant, for heaven's sakes. Don't do that. The effect here, though, I think is very expressive. It's very expressive and effective. As it turns out, popular music in a variety of genres um, has vestiges of traditional harmonic progressions, but they're in entirely new contexts. So just take that idea of uh, how, we, how we would reach home, okay? So we're in this key. So we might go a four, a five, a one. We might go two, five, one. If you're a jazzer, you might go two, five, one, <laughs> okay? However, a pop musician probably isn't going to do that. They might go... That's flat six, flat seven, one. Even John Williams, who turned 90 last week. If you remember the end of Return of the Jedi during the Ewok celebration music, he does that very thing. You remember? Yub nub. <laughs> okay. Part four, the music of hip hop. According to several recent surveys conducted by Statistica, Y Pulse, and the International Federation of the Phonographic Industry, hip hop is the most popular music genre in the United States among Generation Z, the second most popular in the world, close behind pop which really means K-pop, which really means BTS. The popularity of hip hop was on full display at this year's Super Bowl halftime show, which featured rappers Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, Eminem, 50 Cent, and Kendrick Lamar performing some of their best known songs. By the way, yes, that was Anderson Pac playing the drums with Eminem special guest appearance. When Lamar was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for composition in 2018 for his album, Damn, it became clear to me that I needed to learn about this music because I'm embarrassed to admit it. It had rarely been a part of my listing hab habits and uh, much less my teaching portfolio. So um, there are some stumbling blocks when studying hip hop through a music theory lens. Um, because the music is typically constructed from borrowed samples of other people's music, um, or with constructed beats, it can be difficult to define the composer of a given rap song. The rapper is the poet, but the role of composer is often filled by a producer who assembles samples in collaboration with the rapper. Now, Lamar's Dam is unusual because most of the music was created specifically for that album. But it is still true that the musical landscape, aside from the rap, is usually created first in hip hop songwriting. That's an inversion of the text music relationship we find in the classical art song, where the text is created by a poet and then a composer sets it. Um, now, uh, there's a theorist named Kyle Adams who has written about hip hop, and I'm really drawing on his work here. And he wrote, quote, analysis of rap therefore requires a shift in focus, whereby we examine the music first to see which rhythms, groupings, or motives are then used in the lyrics. Not only is this approach more fruitful for rap, than a traditional text music analysis, it also better reflects the way in which the music was originally conceived. The best way to analyze many rap songs may be to examine not how the music supports the text, but how the text supports the music." End quote. Now, another notable difference we encounter with hip hop is the formal structure. Since the accompaniment is typically constructed of looped rhythmic phrases, the form is often cyclical rather than goal-directed, which is often the case with um, concert music. Okay. So consider, for example, the chorus of Big Boy's 2003 song, Tomb of the Boom. And I'm going to use Kyle Adams' transcription here to help us. So the excerpt in question consists of a four-measure loop with three accompanimental layers. So number one is a synth pad that mostly plays long notes and descends by step like this.
it goes back. A syncopated funk bass line it sounds like this. And then there's a drum kit. I'm going to beatbox for you. It's not going to be very good, but this is what it sounds like. Okay. If you put these things together, it sounds something like this. So notice the drum kit plays in each measure, thank you. The same rhythm. The synth pad presents long notes in the first three bars and then does short notes in the last bar. The bass line cuts out for the final, for the final measure. Listen uh, one more time. Now imagine that's happening at the same time that this rap is happening. Can't do everything at the same time, but I can do the rap in my right hand maybe. Okay, here we go. Tomb after tomb, boom, boom after boom. Serving up emotions want you deep inside that tomb. Embryo to newborn, you can feel me in the womb. Cool. Ooh, that's cool. Now, did you notice that the final beat in each bar is long and that each word on that beat rhymes? So listen to the drum beat again and then listen to the rap in the first measure. Tomb after tomb, boom, boom after boom. The rap has been written so that the first line coincides exactly with the rhythm played in the drum kit. The prosody is perfect and takes advantage of the hit on beat four. That hit is preserved in lines two, three, and four of the verse. And in fact, the final word in each line of the text rhymes. To further emphasize the complex interaction between text and accompaniment in the fourth line, the bass cuts out so that we can hear big boy rap that syncopated line. Cool. Ooh, that's cool. So the bass line goes away so we can hear that a little bit more clearly. Now, this is one 11 second excerpt from one song written in 2003. I hope I've conveyed the complex relationship that exists between the text and the music in this excerpt and how fruitful this music can be for both music and textual analysis. Two things we often do in music theory class when we discuss music that includes song or spoken words. Okay, part five, final part. Why do this work? I have focused our discussion today on how we might adapt aspects of our current theoretical framework to music that has been marginalized in our music theory classrooms. I've tried to give examples of such music that I feel is rich in content and meaning, but I haven't made an argument yet as to why we should make the effort to diversify our curriculum in this way. On the one hand, I think a compelling case can be made that current undergraduate music students inhabit a world in which classical music is an ever-shrinking part of the musical landscape. And to best prepare for the diverse musical world we live in, students need many more tools than we are currently providing. If we were to simply focus our curricula on the educational standards that our future music educators are expected to use as learning goals, we would emphasize composition, jazz, popular, and global music rather than classical harmony and counterpoint. If we want our graduates to be successful in their music-related jobs, we need to equip them with the right toolkit. A recent alum shared with me last week that, quote, just training yourself as a concert musician is not enough. We should validate musical experiences outside the concert tradition, end quote. This is the economic argument. But an even more compelling and urgent argument is the moral one. For far too long, the only voices seen and heard in our music theory curriculum have been white males, most of whom died decades or even centuries ago. They have long had seats at our collective table. Do we have the creativity and the will to set a few more places at the table? As a student member of the music department's anti-racism task force recently shared with me, quote, in our education courses, when we learn, about, we learn about the concepts of windows and mirrors, a window allows you to look inside another person's experience, someone different from you. A mirror reflects your own culture. 
We need to see ourselves and each other in the educational process. For BIPOC students, rarely is there a mirror. For white students, all they experience are mirrors and they miss out on the windows. In the music department, we strive to create a welcoming and inclusive atmosphere for all students, staff, and faculty. But that sentiment should go beyond the important work of hospitality and collegiality. When a student enters one of our learning spaces, they should expect to both see some part of themselves reflected in the curriculum, as well as learn about a person, group, or culture outside their identity. I'll close with a short anecdote shared with me by a recent music alumna. She remembered how an instructor had once brought a small excerpt of Rwandan folk music into her ear training class to help demonstrate a particular concept. After that class, she wept when she realized that it was the first time she had ever encountered part of her own culture in a classroom. For, then, for the instructor, that bit of music was intended as a window, albeit a small one for the majority white class. For the black student, daughter of recent immigrants, one of the handful of students of color in the music department, it was a welcome mirror. Thank you. Yes, uh, the fellow I mentioned, Philip Ewell, uh, along with two or three others, is working on a theory book right now. It should be published within the next year or so. And when it does, I'm sure we'll look at it and see if it might be something that could that could be useful for us uh, here. That's the one that I'm that I'm aware of. Yeah, Malachi. Um, that's an odd idea to me because clearly a lot of people are listening to music by Koreans, they're listening to music by African Americans, they're, they're consuming it, they're engaging with it, it's important music to them, um, and this is the music of our time. And I think we need to understand how it's put together. Now I understand, especially with uh, hip hop, things can get a little murky because oftentimes the, the raps deal with some really uncomfortable issues. There's a lot of misogyny, there's um, violence, there are drug references aplenty, um, but this actually is a slice of, of modern day life. And I think rather than push it away and say, it doesn't belong to us, it's not our culture, I think there are ways that we can engage with it and learn, and learn from it. Um, and I, I would rather be on that side rather than using it as an excuse to say, you're right, we just shouldn't touch that. I would also use the same argument though to say, okay, um, what do we have in common with Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart at this point? Not much. And yet his music still speaks to us, absolutely it does. And I would say it absolutely belongs in the classroom. But to use that as an example and say this is our culture and we're and we're you know embracing it, that's also a kind of a funny idea, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Honey. Yeah, we just have to keep doing it until it's clear that we're not tokenizing. I would say that the Scott Joplin example in the textbook feels a little bit like a token to me. But we're at the point right now where we just have to get used to doing it so it doesn't feel like a token. If we, if we use that as an excuse not to do it, then we're not doing the work. And so yes, I'm, I'm prepared to tokenize a little bit. If it feels like that to some people, I'm willing to take that heat 
because I think it's important for the music. We have to start someplace. And, you know, I've been trying to incorporate more material, you know, into my courses, but I can't redo the whole thing at once. I can do bits and pieces, right? So to give you an example, in 2018, when I taught Theory 4, um, it was entirely concert music. I don't think there was, a, there was maybe one African-American composer in that class. It was not on my radar. And I'm embarrassed to admit it, but that's, that's, the, that's the way it was. 2020, as the pandemic was happening, there was a little bit more. But last year, it was about two-thirds concert music, with about half of that being from BIPOC musicians, and the other third was popular music and hip-hop. This semester, it's more half and half. Yeah, is that Jamie back there? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. There's legislation and all that stuff that we're not supposed to talk about race and all that kind of stuff. So how are you recommend subtly incorporating it into like a high school choir class? Uh, <laughs> yes. One of I mean, this is this is my privilege. I'm a tenured full professor at a lovely liberal arts college. I don't, I never am worried that someone is going to object to something I bring into the classroom unless I really, you know, if I mess something up, of course, people should call me out on it or call me in, I, I think is a better way than calling out. But um, no, and the public school is, is, a, is a different can of worms altogether, right? And I think that's an evolving story. Um, I, I certainly hope that we get to the point where um, we feel you know, emboldened to do the kind of work that we know that that students need, that young students need. I think about that all that all the time with you know two two kids in public schools right now, you know, and I feel lucky that I know what their teachers how they think and what is important to them. But I don't want it to feel like oh we lucked out. I want it to feel like yes, this is what's happening everywhere. Yeah, yeah Spencer. Of a white racial lens, or is it just music theory is white, something else is, is different? Right, right. Yeah, no, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. And um, I am not of the opinion that we need to throw everything out. In fact, I, I think it's just a matter of making room for things. So I'll, I'll just give you an example. You know, um, by the way, I did not require my students to come here, but I'm so glad that you're here. I really, it's, it's lovely. I really appreciate it, so thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so I'll give you an example. Um, so we're about to study fugue in the, in the form class. That is something which I just feel like, and you know, this is a part of me that I'm not ready to give this up yet. Sorry, Kathy. And maybe you wouldn't be either if you were teaching theory. I don't know. I just feel like Every music major should really have to deal with trying to write a fugue. It's really hard, and you really have to get your mind around it. It's a form. Well, no, I just, you know, we talk about this a lot, you know. But I'm not going to spend five classes on it. We're going to spend three classes. We're going to get our feet wet. We're going to do our, the best we can with the exposition of a fugue. But we're not going to, you know, tie ourselves into knots figuring out, okay, is that a false return there? Is that, you know, we're not gonna, we don't, I don't think that's as important, you know, for every music major to have. Corey, do you agree with that? Or do you think that's, is that sacrilege? Putting you on the spot here, it's not fair. I'm sorry, my mind is saying that you need Yeah, is it okay to focus on just the exposition of a, of a, of a fugue? Yeah, rather than do a full analysis, yeah. Right, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I'm, I'm not ready to give up that part of the curriculum just yet. Maybe in another year or two, I'll feel differently about it. But if that makes it possible for us to study a film score, which we're gonna do, I mean, I don't think that's ever studied in the music theory, it hasn't been studied in a music theory class before, but my gosh, it's, you know, orchestras are not programming film music just to get to sell tickets. That's partly what they're doing. Partly they're realizing, though, who writes better for the orchestra than John Williams? 
very, very few people. Who writes better for brass? John Williams, King, right? And you know, most brass players are like, oh yeah, John Williams writes great for the hard, but he really knows those instruments. So, you know, an orchestra is really like, I mean, watch any YouTube video, especially like watch that wonderful Vienna Philharmonic videos of John Williams conducting that orchestra. They're, they're smiling, not because, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, here's a musical god here or anything like that. They just, they, they genuinely love the music. So yeah, come on, let's do it. Ben. Mm -hmm. fits in music theory because like when we look at when we're like looking at like western art songs uh typically in theory we only like analyze the text to the extent of like how it um affects the music mm -hmm. right and if it's like a Schubert like like what you're doing is by Schubert it's not about it's by the poet it's like their, right. their name isn't part of the language yeah. you know? <laughs> it's it's right it's and you, you gotta have a little bit and you gotta like like the text is like Obviously, such a fundamental part. It's like the poet mm -hmm. or the poet songwriter, whatever you want. To, like, it's, it's yeah. such a critical part of that. When we do, I'm, I'm wondering, like, when we're thinking about the actual, because you, you talk about the words a little bit, talk about like, yep. the rhythms and stuff. Yeah. But when we talk about the actual meaning of the words in your mind, does that fit? Is, is that like relevant in the music? I mean, obviously, it's relevant to understanding the music, but is it relevant yeah. in, a, in the classroom where it's like that doesn't really delve into music side of things of like literature? No, oh, oh, for sure. That's a great question. And, you know, um, I think it depends. With Kendrick Lamar, absolutely, you've got to study the meaning. That's very intentional. And there, you know, there's a whole world <laughs> in, that Kendrick Lamar creates, and he creates characters and, and all of this. You know, with Big Boy, and a lot of times the words are, you know, it's not really telling a story. It's kind of, it can even be nonsensical, but it's like the right, the right rhyme. The right, right word that fits that rhythm, and and it's and it's delightful, and we can enjoy it. But yeah, there's not, and you know, they would freely admit it. There's no deeper meaning here. It's just a really cool rhyme, you know, and that's okay too. So I, I think it depends. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Have a completely different conception of pitch and scale and yep. Is that another way to decolonize? Uh, that yeah, that would be the that be that'd be the next layer that we can kind of peel away. The the problem with that is simply that, you know, to really understand like the Indian Sulkatu system with those rhythmic syllables, I mean, you study with a a guru to learn that over a period of many, many, you know, years oftentimes. And so trying to distill that into a theory that we can present and to have faculty that are trained to do that, we're not, we're not there yet. And that, that's the thing that, that, that would worry me a little bit about delving into that. Right now, I feel like we got our work cut out for us, just trying to get, you know, some more popular genres and jazz into the, into the curriculum, maybe gospel and, and some other things like that. Yeah, Amy? And what might you say to the other artists here about how this can shape our art? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I feel like, um, well, I like, like, I think just about any, um, you know, faculty member teaching in the music department at Luther, we all received almost the same kind of education. It is only now beginning to, to change a little bit, right? So, um, and I grew up with classical music. That was, that was the music that I loved, especially, you know, contemporary classical music. Well, not like 20th century, I really should say, not, not, not so much contemporary. Um, and that's the music that's still dear and dear to my heart. And, I've, and during doing this research, it hasn't made me think, oh, I should feel guilty for liking Stravinsky or Shostakovich, you know? No, I still love those, those composers. And, you know, um, I, I hope that at my memorial service, there will be a pianist around who could play a little Debussy or a little Ravel.
That's that's what I love, and I'll always love that music. But but that doesn't have to first of all define who I am as an artist. I can I can grow, but more importantly, and this is not really getting at your question, but I think it's important. This should not define me as a teacher. I know it's important to teach what you love and teach what you know, and I think that's a great place to start. But it would it, you would not be getting your money's worth if I just taught the things that I loved. I mean, yes, Sondheim, great. Ravel, great. Debussy, great. Sibelius, lots to learn there. But you know, like I have a weird palette, you know. <laughs> and right now, some of those things, like you know, I was all ready to do a, a Sibelius symphony this year in my theory class, and you know, at some some point I'll turn back to that. I think it's much more important right now that you learn Florence Price's Third Symphony. That piece is so much more relevant and you know, has equally wonderful riches in it. No offense to Sibelius, who's also one of my favorites, right? I just think right now this is what we're being called to do, what I'm being called to do at least. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, and I think <laughs> I'm. <laughs> um, I see Luther over there, and we're working through me and white supremacy. And this week, we're working through that chapter, which is about are you appropriating? Are you know? And I th I think about that a lot. Um, I feel like what I can do, and, and if I can do it successfully, I feel like I can, I can be a witness. So, yes, I have used and and adapted like spirituals in my music. I hope that I've made them my own in a particular way. I mean, they're not my own, but I hope I've referred to them in a way that makes it feel like I'm not, I'm not appropriating. But I realize that other people might listen to that music and feel, feel differently about it. Um, one thing I do feel good about is like, you know, I am not profiting off of it. I'm not making any money off of it. If I ever make any money, I, well, yeah. Someone asked if they could purchase a score and I said, you know, I, Please have it, but if I was going to charge, you know, twenty-five bucks for it, why don't you give twenty-five dollars to this um, to this nonprofit that I think would be a good recipient of it? So, you know, and I don't think I need to like broadcast that. So I'm being performative about it. That's the other thing that's that's tricky about it. Um, you know, and I this is what I feel called to do right now. You know, Tyler um, doing this kind of work, um, and at some point I may have, may feel differently about it. So, but yeah, I've, I've thought about it a lot and. Um, you know, I think we have to find our own way as, as artists. Um, and there are ways of doing anti-racism work as creative people that, you know, doesn't feel performative, that feels like you're, you know, being a witness and that you're being responsive, but you're doing it in such a way that you're, you know, you're, you're collaborating and, and contributing to bringing beauty into the world. That, that's, that's what we're supposed to try and figure out what to do. So good luck with that. Welcome to, we're not back to our reception mode yet um, in, 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 the, in, the, in the COVID time, but you sure could, you know, stay, stay around to ask, ask further, sure thing. further questions. And so appreciate such a good audience tonight. Uh, and yeah, again, um, another thanks to, to Professor Joseph. Welcome. Back. Um, decolonizing the teaching of science and the history of science. So just stay, stay tuned.